Have a seat, man. How's everything going? I'm exhausted. Are you? <laughs> yeah, no, everything's going great. <laughs> Congratulations on your uh, your show got picked up for a second season. Yeah. Yeah. Do Is that why no- you're exhausted? You were like, I thought this was going to be a one season deal. Now I got to no, go back to no, work. No, no, no. That's the, that's the last thing on my mind right now. Doing the second season of the show just because everything is no, it's just been a heavy press week for yeah. this film. Yeah. You don't panic though when you do a show? Like do you go through the thing like are they gonna pick it up? Are they not gonna pick it up? Or do you just kinda are you comfortable just letting it fall wherever it falls? Um, I think you just enjoy yourself, especially if it's comedy. You just make it as good as you can, hope for the best. Episode always, by episode. I, I always assumed they would pick up a trial and error because it's just so good. Yeah. I mean, really a terrific, smart comedy. Yeah. It did take them a while to finally commit to it because it's uh, it was it was a challenge, you know. Any time breaking through to people's consciousness was something that's that different. Yeah, you, you never know whether it's going to completely work. But NBC just loved it. And timing is important. I think one of the reasons that it worked is because like all the court stuff that goes on, like people are used to it. Like people got so wrapped up in making a murderer and then yeah. they got so wrapped up in the FX OJ series last yeah. year and they got, yeah. you know, all this stuff is like top of mind. So the idea that you could follow this along in a comedy, yeah. you know what I mean? Your minds are conditioned now yeah. to following along court drama, but just it, and it different worked. Lens. I mean, people really wanted to know and people were stopping me on the street and saying, come on, tell me, did you do it? <laughs> This I'd, ha- I'd never experienced before. Right, especially <laughs> because it's a comedy, so it's like you'd think that that would be an afterthought, yeah, but right. people really are wrapped up in the, yeah. in the whodunit part. They're not asking you Churchill questions. We all know how that <laughs> turned out. <Yeah. laughs> That's the nice thing about history. No surprise endings. Yeah. You are finished with The Crown, too. I don't know why it's in the prep sheet that season two. There's Obviously, there's no more for you to do there. I did do a tiny little flashback scene, oh, flashback. but I did it you know, over a year ago, you know, uh, I, I wrapped up my participation in The Crown a year ago in February, so. Wow. They said the Queen saw it. Somebody got her to actually, her, one of her sons, I guess, uh, uh, got her to, uh, Prince Edward uh, told her to, to watch it, and she liked it. She thought a couple of her things were a little dramatized, but overall they said she really liked it. Well, you more, know more than I do. I mean, there, <laughs> it's one of the whole uh, ideas of the series that royals never tell. You just never know what their lives are like. Right. Uh, they certainly don't express opinions to the public. Have you met any of them? I've met Charles on three occasions. We well, might have talked about this last time. I don't remember. My memory is really bad. Did, did I ask that last time, Sam? I don't remember hearing about it. Okay, so where, where, where did you meet him? Uh, well, I, I've been in three performances where he was in the audience. And at the end, uh, there is a kind of uh, greeting line. And you meet Charles and exchange a few... Uh, kind of banal sentences with him. What did you uh, say to him? Well, you just let him take the lead. There's, uh, and he'll comment on some completely dull aspect of what he's just seen. They're absolute experts at making inconsequential small talk. Really? Because yeah. they're not supposed to have an opinion they're on any not, level. They can't yeah. have you it's, going and doing an interview and being like, you know what he really thinks. That's right. You're never going to find him in this chair. Right, chat, chatting amiably with you <laughs> about what he really thinks about anything. Did he? Did he mention something completely? That, yeah, I, general, general, was, yeah. I, I remember once uh, he I, there was a big royal command performance in Southern California, actually, of the Royal Shakespeare Company, and I went with my wife. And when we met him at intermission, she actually engaged him about. Tony Blair. This was long before anybody had heard of, of Tony Blair over here, but Tony Blair had been in school with Charles and, in fact, had been in a, in a play, a Shakespeare play with him, I believe. I have this right. And, and my wife Mary actually had a genuine chat with Charles. Everybody was kind of surprised that he was opening up that much to her. My, my darling wife is a Montana gal, and very kind of informal and loose. And at a certain point, she <laughs> smacked him on the shoulder. And everybody in the, you know, like 50 people in the room, their spines suddenly stiffened. Yet you know, I was so proud of her. <laughs> but he probably didn't care. No, he was delighted. He was having such a great chat with her. 
Yeah, well, that never happens. Nobody's ever got the balls to, to do yeah, that. So well, the fact it, that never, it somehow didn't occur to her that it was inappropriate. <laughs> I talked to someone, I forget who it was, but they worked with Michael Jackson. It might have been Chuck Zito or some guy. And uh, he did something like he grabbed Michael and he hugged him. I, or, or, or it might have been an actor we spoke to. And he goes, everybody was horrified because yeah. nobody touches yeah. My, but when you do it, they like they appreciate you treating them like a real person. I, I remember meeting Hillary Clinton. Uh, it was not the first time I'd met her, but she was the host of the State Department dinner at the Kennedy Center Honors, which she did every year. She was Secretary of State and loved doing it. I met her, and she had this huge smile, and we'd met once or twice before. And I leaned, I lunged forward and kissed her on the cheek. <laughs> and... That was probably the least appropriate thing I'd ever done. Yeah. Did she react poorly to it? No, she was beaming. She with grabbed a big him by smile. the face and kissed him on the mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, she she loved she loved that evening. She Who loved, was being honored? Well, it was the five or six honorees of that year. I think Meryl Streep, Yo Yo Ma, uh, you know, big heavy hitters in 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 uh, the arts. What's amazing about uh, royalty, though, is that. Like you just said, there'll be a there'll be a meeting line to meet Charles after your performance. Like yeah, generally, right. <laughs> like somebody goes to a performance and they get to go back and meet you. Yeah, yeah. But after you're done performing, you get exactly. to go meet Charles. But it was a big deal. There was another occasion, the the uh, big I think 150th celebration of the music, uh, the Academy of Music in Philadelphia, and she and Camilla were there, and I met Camilla on that occasion. You get very nervous knowing they're in the audience. You do. Uh, yeah, it's, I, I don't know, it, 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 somehow being conscious of anybody in the audience uh, makes it a li- that just that little bit more uh, intense. But most performers won't admit that. Like, you ask yeah. a performer, they're like, no, no, I just do, I was going to ask you if they were nervous, I didn't think you, but I'm glad well, to hear you say that you are. you know, you, a lot of actors don't like to be told there's anybody in the audience. It's much de- e- easier dealing with an audience if it feels completely anonymous. I remember once... I was in a, a play, and a good friend of mine, an actor, Jonathan Price from England, was in the audience. Wasn't he in Glengarry Glen Ross? Uh, in England he was, uh, not here. He wasn't in the film? He was uh, the engineer in Miss Saigon and won the Tony Award for it. He's, he's a marvelous British actor. He's he, he, a good friend, and Mike Nichols, the great Mike Nichols, were both in the audience. I was so conscious of them out there in the audience, that at a certain point, I completely went up on my words in the middle of a big argument scene, a big high point intense scene. I was suddenly completely lost. So what did you do? How did you get back to where you're supposed to be? Uh, oh, uh, the, uh, my, the actor on stage with me, Boyd Gaines, he sort of managed to get me back on track. But it was... It was about. It was probably about six seconds. It felt like about an hour of total heart attack. And you time. know, your 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 peers, these great actors, are out there watching well, you. Well, all like... you can think of is the pe- is your friends watching you. Yeah. Screw the pooch. And you totally forgot the line, or you put the wrong line where you. No, sh- I just totally forgot. You it. Just Suddenly, blanked. I didn't know where I was. And there was nothing to do because what are you going to just oh, go back to the beginning yeah. of the scene? Oh my God! It was prob- probably probably in, in intensely dramatic moment. <laughs> and in fact, nobody seemed to have noticed it. Yeah, they backstage. probably thought it was part of the performance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. The uh, uh, that's that's the best part. Of it. One of the best parts about doing radio is that like I get freaked out like that when I find out certain people have listened to a show. But it's yeah. not until after the show's done. Yeah, right. so I'm like, exactly. I didn't realize like you were listening to that, but I did. I'm never yeah. conscious of it yeah. as it's happening. Yeah, I prefer not to know. I knew De Niro was in the audience one time years ago at the Comedy Cellar, uh-huh. and uh, he was back. They were doing research for something. He's in the back of the room, and I'm on stage, and I, I was doing a clean set because I think I had Jimmy Kimmel coming up, and I do a joke, and I hear like the ha. It was like the Max Cady laugh from, from the theater. It was fucking, it Bob De Niro? It was him. Oh God! How he, he was in the back, but it was. It, I did, Is he I, smoking a cigar? No, but it wouldn't would have, have bothered anybody. Perfect. But he had. It was his laugh, and then the next joke I tripped on yeah. and bombed because I became so aware <laughs> oh, yeah. that he had just laughed I know. out loud. Isn't it amazing the things that happen to your brain? Yeah. Oh, God. Is yeah. there it's, is there anybody that you want to meet that you haven't? Because I mean, you've been. You know, you've met so many yeah. people throughout your... You mean in show business? Or? In general, I guess. Oh, I don't know. I, the people I really get impressed with are fantastic athletes. Really? Yeah. 
I've still never met LeBron James. That would be a treat. Yeah. Really? Are just, you a big basketball fan, or do you just like him? Oh, both. Both. Uh, I just I just watched the basketball last night. Just, these guys are superhuman. I'm so right? bummed out, though, that, that it looks like LeBron's not going to— I mean, I don't want to jinx it, but it looks like LeBron is not going to get Three this nothing, championship. No. no, they were because, so close to it last night. And you want, like, because I want— Has he gotten one for Cleveland? Yeah. No. He has. has. Oh, yeah, he yeah. He did last, last year. year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The big— but Incredibly but I want like dramatic. LeBron to be this like invincible superhero Jordan level guy. But yeah, like but there's so many good. We wouldn't be sports fans if things weren't at stake, though. Right. That if you just knew like, well, yeah. LeBron's gonna get this one again. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. But and I'm a pro wrestling fan, so I like the good guy to just keep winning and winning and winning and winning and winning. I know the feeling. I don't. Uh, I don't watch basketball anymore. But he's kind of interesting. I, I, I don't. I didn't know that the championship was happening until they were down two nothing. I'm like, really? Oh, is that going? It's, yeah, I haven't paid attention. It's two unbelievable teams. Yeah. I mean, it's really. Great. Do you go to games? Yeah, when I can. You can't I'm, get back to meet LeBron. You're John Lithgow. I, I actually, I sat in LeBron's seats in Philadelphia once, but I never got to meet him. Wow. I I had gotten to know his uh, one of his team his. Uh, Entourage, what? all in the hotel, and they got me in. Did you ever go to Laker? I mean, the first celebrity that was known to really start going to, was Nicholson going to Laker games. That was yeah. the big thing. Yeah. He would yeah. always be. Does he still go or no? Well, I think he does. I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm. Sure, I can't imagine a Laker game without him. Would you flip out if you found out LeBron was a Harry and the Hendersons fan? This is the kind of thing I just love. <laughs> I can't even believe that these guys have even seen me. You know? Really? Yeah. Because, you know, wonderful. I mean, they probably have them grew up all watching. All of them. I know, Rock. sure. You know, they all know. I know, I know. They're all fans. But, but you're all, still, you're always surprised. Yeah. You, you get different. surprised when people you like recognize you. Yeah, yeah. Different worlds, you know. Who was the last person that, uh, that you really were, you admired that was like, I'm just a big fan of yours? Oh, gosh. Uh... Well, I guess Prince Charles. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very somehow you don't don't picture people watching you. Right. Uh, I was told that Hillary and Bill were in a deep funk, quite understands understandably after the election this and year. They holed up in Chappaqua and binge watched The Crown. I was, really. Uh, I was found that very touching. Yeah, it, it, you you like knowing that people watch you. It's got to be odd, but on your, your level, I wouldn't think you're shocked by it. But it's kind of encouraging to know that you still get surprised by it. Yeah, too. yeah, it's. Uh, I don't know. It's a funny thing throwing it out there. You, you, you're just you're in your own little world, or you're in a world with a bunch of other actors, and uh, it's kind of funny to. I mean, you must experience the same thing there. Thousands of people listening to you right now, if not millions, and you don't really think of them. It's just the three of us in a room talking. Especially on an individual. You almost right. think of like the audience as a group. Yeah. And then when you realize it's individual people who are like, no, I love the show and I listen every day and I'm a, I'm a person who lives my life that way. And you're yeah. like, oh, my God. In, in fact, if you do think about it, it sort of freezes you up. Yeah. You're sort of yeah. Not, not yourself. When you go to like a party or, or there's things, are, are you, are you, do you have access to everything you want? Like you, when you, you know, I go to like a, a, a big uh, place, there's always an area I can't get into. <laughs> there's always like, oh, that's where I want to be and yeah. I can't get in. They're like, no, no, you're, the, you're a pre-party guy. <laughs> you're yeah. not actually. Yeah. yeah. I think absolutely everybody has that experience at some point. You know, do I really belong here? It's kind of, by the way. This is exactly Beatrice at dinner. Yeah. Uh, this this movie that we opens this week, this is the position that Salma Hayek's character... What is it about? It's about a dinner, as in the title. Uh, I play a billionaire real estate developer. This dinner is three hugely wealthy men and their three wives, six people. But by a couple of turns of plot, there's a seventh guest, and it is this... Uh, Mexican immigrant physical therapist, kind of spiritual healer who takes care of the woman of the house who has sort of gotten stuck in their house because her car break, breaks down and gets offhandedly invited to dinner. And it's a very uh, curious situation in which case people, uh, rich people who are usually only communicating with each other right. suddenly have to deal with Someone from a totally different The help, world. in a way. The help. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Like, you've been to a lot of, of parties, and your character in the movie is like, uh, uh, I don't want to say racist, but certainly uh, uh, thinks well, on a... Well, he's the alpha guest, and he's he's the most powerful man in the room. And yeah. And he's, he's 
condescending almost, towards immigrants and yeah, he's almost unconsciously superior. Right. Uh, yeah, have you encountered that? I'm not asking you to mention names, but do, is that person, that character, is that somebody that you have encountered at at parties in the oh, past? Oh, various times. Yeah, yeah. You go to parties and. Uh, I mean, great big high rollers who produce films as a hobby. You know, they'll throw a great big Oscar party and you're at their unbelievable homes in Los Angeles that you didn't even know existed. And you suddenly realize, wow, I am out of my element here. But so much of the of the Hollywood community is liberal. And so I would think that the opinions that your character had in this movie, they don't really line up with that. So is that is, is that take... Something that you get from from rich people, you well, know, in your business. I mean, as for the movie, this is very clever film written by Mike White, directed by Miguel Arteta. It sort of deliver deliberately throws off absolutely everybody. It it uh, it takes all your expectations and upends them, so that mm-hmm. so that this man who, of course. By any, from what you already know about the film, you assume he's the villain of the piece, but he has other aspects to him. He surprises you with how convincing he is when he's trying to persuade Beatrice of his worldview. Uh, it, it's really great. It's so far from being black and white, all of the different issues that get debated. I'm talking about it as if it's a very serious film. In fact, it's a very funny and ironic film that just gets extremely complicated and challenging as it goes yeah. along. When yeah. you do something like that, like you play a guy who has to convince somebody or you have to have a totally different opinion than you might really have, do you ever change the way you actually feel? Like, are you able to, like, when you look at it, like your job is to convince this woman of something that you, John Lithgow might not, but do you look at that and go, yeah, that actually is a pretty good point? Uh, well, it's, I know that it's it's unsettling. It's it's unsettling to me and to to like-minded people you know we all all of us travel in worlds of groupthink you know my friends basically have my politics sure. and i have theirs this character says things that are so alarming and yet you know you hear it on tv people do say these things uh, it, it, there's a terrific uh, tr- tension uh, you you just create this kind of anxiety the fact that a man like this will say these things with blithely as if as if they're they're the god's truth how do you convince yourself when you're saying it to 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 make it believable well you're just play acting and you know you you know a good script when you see one you know the impact that a scene like that is going to have uh, and it's a very complex and ironic impact. And you don't feel comfortable in those parts. I'm surprised to hear that too. Like you said, and you feel out of your element, like with those uh, in the in the, the houses. Big rich of those. parties. Yeah, but everybody does at some point. Because uh, there's I, always somebody richer, right? Like there's like, like yeah, levels there's... of richness just keep going up and up and yeah, up. Yeah, or you know, uh, I yeah, I go I go all weak need when I meet hotshot athletes. Because, right. oh, God, you know, you're sort of breathless with admiration. Mm-hmm. Uh, Who have you met that really s- kind of stopped you in your tracks? Uh, Michael Jordan. You, you met know? Michael? Yeah. H- yeah. How did that happen? Well, uh, Phil Jackson is a very good friend of mine. And uh, when he was awesome. the coach uh, when he was the coach of the Bulls, uh, I had a great entree and met all those guys. And there was actually a moment when all the cast of Third Rock from the Sun went to Chicago to do the Oprah show, and I invoked my J- Phil Jackson privileges and got us all into a Bulls game. And we met them all. In fact, uh, uh, Dennis Rodman gave me his autographed, his sweaty autographed jersey. Do you still have it? You know, I somehow, I think it was stolen from, no. my, from my hotel room. Isn't that awful? That's from terrible. the hotel. At, at, that's at that's that amazing. Point, a game you point, signed Rodman jersey, and, and it was a period when he was doing that after every game. Was it a jersey or a dress? <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was a very, very sweaty jer- jersey. You know, uh, we could have proved by DNA sure. that it was yeah. actually his, but, but uh, sadly, it uh, it disappeared somewhere along the line. Were you surprised to see him in North Korea with Kim Jong Un? Isn't it weird how things work right. out? You know, this is a crazy world. It really is nuts. That's, that's what I love about acting, the fact that people will do anything. And it exposes you to, like, a, being an athlete or being an actor exposes you to people. 
that you should never be exposed to. Like, you know what I mean? Like, the fact that Kim Jong-un likes him. Yeah, right, right. Like, what an odd thing that yeah. is. Him and his father were big Bulls fans. Yeah. And they can't get Jordan to come over, and I'm sure they can't get some of the other guys or Pippen. Well, I'll have to find out if he's a third rock fan. Well, that's what I was about to say. I'm sure, like... <laughs> The same like level of weirdness happens. Like there've got to be just yeah. odd people. They could be the most despicable people on earth, but they're escape. Yeah, like, their one happy place is watching like reruns of Third Rock. There's or whatever a sort it is. of anthropological aspect to acting, going out and just looking at how bizarre people can be. Yeah, yeah, including, and... including world class, famous people. Yeah, you're entertaining people, some who are great and some who are terrible. Like, that's the, you know, yeah, like, right. oh, my God, Paul Potts, a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> you have no control answer. over I it. I have yeah. a fan letter from Paul Pot, in fact. <laughs> Joke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was ready to hug you. That, that would have been the greatest thing I've ever heard. Have you gotten weird or obsessive fan mail? I'm sure in, in the amount of time you've been doing it, you've, uh, sure. in, in the type of roles you've had, you've had to have attracted a couple uh, of I've crazies. I've had a few. I don't, I don't read a lot of it. Uh, I have gotten the most wonderful responses from uh, from people on uh, for the Crown for the Winston Churchill performances uh, that have just come in by email. Like I got an email from Dustin Hoffman out of the, out of the blue. Wow, whom I have met a couple of times in passing, but we're not friends. It, it just uh, that kind of thing. Really. What did he say to you? Just how much he enjoyed He's, you? He says, you know, it's not easy complimenting another, another actor, but I just have to. In this case, something like that. Uh, very Dustin. Um, but, you know, that that makes you pay attention. Not co easy complimenting another actor. Is that, Do you think that's more like it's hard because it's fairly competitive or, or, you, or, or certain guys oh, try not to watch? I, I think he was making fun of himself and all actors. Oh, I okay. mean, it is a... We we're all we're all prone to envy, you know. Uh, there's plenty of people who are doing things I wish I'd got, and I know the, the the opposite is true. Have you auditioned recently, like in the last few years, and not gotten something you've auditioned for? Or you, you seem to become an offer only guy. I haven't guy. auditioned in years. Uh, I'm lucky that way. Sometimes I actually I'm I have been offered jobs, and I've said, you know. Let me come in and work with you on this. I, let's audition this for each other. Uh, just because I, I, I myself want to know whether this... I'm doing a workshop in a couple of weeks of a piece of work, which I just want to see whether it works or not. You want to see if you can pull it off and if it feels right? Yeah. Exactly. Are, are there times where you'll go, like, I don't think I can do this well? Uh, yeah. In those cases, I turn it down. Wow. But, you know, I have to say some of the most interesting things that I've ever done, I mean, interesting for me and big breakthroughs from, for me, have been bright ideas other people had, which I never would have had for myself, Winston Churchill being one of them. Um, what, what, what was, do you, that's not something you would have seen yourself doing? No, no. I, it would have been. Uh, Who came to you and said this is really something you should uh, do? The director himself. Uh, Stephen Daldry, who's a m marvelous director. I'd always wanted to work with him. So it was like, well, if he believes in me and this job, uh, I'm certainly not going to say no. I was scared to death to do it, but I wasn't going to turn it down. When did you get comfortable with the role? Like, because I would imagine uh, as soon first... As, I, as soon as I started working with the makeup and costume people. You started they, to see what yeah, this is going to yeah, look like they, and feel that like. That really helped me. And, yeah. and also, arriving in England... And having all these English actors welcome me in like it was a great idea to have me play the part. That made an enormous difference. So it's like once you have all these people around, it's like, I, I, look, I might be wrong, but I don't think they're all wrong. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's <laughs> like they had more confidence in me than I had in myself. Yeah. Were you nervous about doing the accent? I beg pardon? Were you nervous about having to do the accent? Uh, yeah, a little. Uh, I had a terrific dialect coach who was working just as much with the English actors as with me. I mean, it was a very different uh, sound to the dialects back in the early 1950s among the royals. Uh, so it, there was this strong sense that we were all in this together. And what was, the, was there any part of it that was particularly hard? You know, the only hard acting is bad writing. And this was such brilliant writing. Peter Morgan, uh, he... He wrote to Churchill's contradictions and insecurities uh, and his old age and his fear of growing old and losing his viability. All these 
great things that you can grab onto. When a writer is helping you out that much, it's not hard. It's amazing that Prince Philip just stopped doing whatever the royal duty. Yeah. Like literally a few months ago, At he was age like ninety five. Ninety five. He's like, and she's ninety, and he's like, I'm done with this crap. <laughs> <laughs> he's just sick and tired of shaking people's hands, and you know. So he just kind of, I guess, he's retiring. Is that what? Is that what? That's what, from those duties, yeah. Which means no more official stuff. Yeah, no more ribbon cutting. So uh, you were saying you were exhausted before because of the uh, just the promotional tour you're on. Is it tougher now? Because, I mean, I, I like what's happened in film in the sense that I don't like that the, you can't get a regular movie in theaters anymore that's not like a blockbuster action thing. But I do like that uh, smaller movies have found a way to reach an audience, and that's through, you know, uh, small theater release and digital release yeah. and things like that. Yeah. Like, those are... It's not like... It, used to be with straight to home video it's it's viable and it's it's real and you can see great films this way but is it is it more difficult to spread the word about a movie like this because you need to reach the audience directly like you're you i i implore you to find this film yeah it, it's part of the bargain you, you 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 have to pitch in to to help raise awareness for yeah. a, a, a particularly an independent film because they have low budgets for producing the film, but low budgets for promoting them too. Mm -hmm. the, 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 and you don't get paid much to do the film, and you don't get paid anything to promote it, but you have a tremendous emotional investment, and especially a film like this, which is uh, so fine. You know, it's, it, the industry is very interesting, you know, just watching the ebb and flow, the different trends. Studio filmmaking is the franchise business. My last two films were Pitch Perfect 3 and Daddy's Home 2, <laughs> both out around Christmas time. Good, reliable, you know, sequels to hugely successful films. That's, that's kind of the studio business, not to mention the comic book franchises, which means that independent films are almost a different industry now. And yet, they are esteemed even more. I mean, you don't see the franchise films nominated for Oscars except in technical areas. Right. None of the actors are given acting nominations. That, that has gradually become the, the purview of very small, independent, and for want of a better word, artistic films, yeah. art films, films with real aspirations the same aspiration a playwright has, putting a play on in off-Broadway in New York. Uh, this, and Beatrice at Dinner is just a perfect example of that. And it comes out tomorrow in select theaters. Uh, where Where's the list of ways people can find this movie? Well, it's only in, in New York and L.A. for okay. the first week, and then I think it goes much wider uh, June 16th or something. Okay, you, can, so, you can Google it. Yeah, find yeah, it look for sure. it. And, and, yeah. and it will come out digitally, I'm sure. And that's been, that's become like one of my new favorite things to do is like iTunes or whatever it is will yeah. pop up with these movies that right. you've never heard of. You'll, you'll see it before you, can you know find it. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary the response we've gotten so far. As I say, it's hard for a little movie like this to break through. One thing that is very much in our favor is the current political situation right. suddenly you know the movie was made long before this political sea change but as soon as november came along the film was all done but it suddenly was a different <laughs> film yeah it meant something else yeah. yeah well i'm looking forward to it and the way you sold it sounds really interesting I, I would i would like to see it well we have a sec right before you go did you work with john cena and daddy's home too oh yeah how was he he's a great <laughs> guy yeah and a really good actor yeah i guess that's what wrestling does for you yeah it turns you into a good actor Daddy's Home 2 is going to be great. I will be back here to talk with you about that. Definitely oh, come good. back, and I'll ask you all my John Cena questions then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not I to was... mention Will Ferrell, Mark Wahlberg, and Mel Gibson. I mean, it's, wow. it's sensational. All right, we got a lot to talk about it's then. sensational. Yeah. All right, we'll see you next time. And, and, the, and it's called uh, Beatriz, am I saying it right? Beatriz. Beatriz at dinner. But you're the only person who's pronounced it right. I did. Just because I told you. Yeah, yeah absolutely, yes. I, I listened to you and I just repeated what you said immediately. I parroted it. Uh, it's in select theaters tomorrow in New York and L.A. And then June 6th it comes out uh, in, in wider release. And John Lithgow on uh, Twitter, am I saying it wrong? 
Yeah, Lithgow. But Lithgow. Yeah, I am matter. saying it wrong. John Lithgow. Um, I think you can pronounce it any way you like, except Kelsey Grammer. <laughs> oh yeah, well you turn the, you turn that rule down. <laughs> oh well, let's not. Good go for there. you. Yeah, <laughs> good for you. Big problem with Kelsey and John. We'll talk about that next time too.